question is, how do we want to do that? Now, there are some different opinions on that, and that is probably where we have a different point of view than other companies have. So uh, grid parity means basically we got a lower cost per watt. And talking about cost per watt, maybe dollar or euro per watt peak, the question is, what is that? For us, it's a total cost. So it's material cost, it's labor cost, and it's the invest cost. On the other side, it's the throughput and it's the power. And clearly, from our point of view, the power is the biggest wheel you can turn on because that has an influence on everything. It has influence on the labor cost, it has influence on the investment cost, it has influence on the material cost, not only on the marginal level, but as well on the total system cost. If I can get on the same square meter the double power, well, the material cost just went down half. Throughput, same thing. If we can get the double amount of square meter through such a production equipment, if we don't have to increase the, the costs, the cost just went half by square meter of margin produced. So for us, these are the two biggest wheels. We don't necessarily see the biggest advantage in going on a bigger scale. We clearly see the highest potential in really getting higher efficiencies up. And it will have a direct impact on the cost. To see that at a, at a more general picture, four pictures, uh, how we see that and how we are planning and committed ourselves to do so is, I mean, one thing we see on the top left side are the nominal fab capacities. When we had first contracts, you've seen before, uh, 2006, 2007, people were talking about 20 and 40 megawatt plants. I mean, there was always the uh, already the statement before, I remember as well, five years ago, people asked, can we make the system half the size or quarter the size because capacity was far too big. Now, this is changing now quite rapidly. 2006, 2007, 40 megawatt plants. Going 2008, uh, this year is more 60, 80 megawatt plants. The year after, you're talking about 120, 240. Going in 2010, I would expect first gigawatt plants are coming up and running. What remains to be seen who is really ex able to execute in this time frame really going to one gigawatt. So there, the key part will be executing fast and having the right technology. On the top right side, I see the module efficiency. We started with amorphous technology, even though I would say five, six years ago, everybody said amorphous silicon is not really a product for this market. It became one, but clearly for us still the main focus is Micromorph. So end of 2007, we introduced Micromorph that allows us to go above 9% on efficiency, and it should lead well above 10%. After that, there will be next generation thin film applications based still on silicon based, but my, maybe combinations or additional developments on that side. On the bottom left side, the CapEx per watt, so basically to keep that chain, uh, simple, it's uh, pretty much, we got a cut cost in half, and that's got to be as well on the CapEx per watt side. Now, what is really interesting, I mean, it's always a discussion, particularly if you're an equipment supplier, it's the CapEx, but uh, the main factor is the cost of ownership, and that's actually on the bottom right one. So in 2007, we've seen the 20 megawatt plants fully ramped up in production going, let's say, a Euro 12, between a Euro 10 and a Euro 20 of uh, cost. And our clear commitment is in 2010, we want to be ready with production solution that allows us to go to 52 to 54 euro cent per watt peak. Now, this is quite an ambitious goal. It was quite some discussion internally, particularly with uh, R&D and with, with uh, our engineering department, but we clearly have a path to get there, and I think we need to go there if we want to reach grid parity. Then the market will be quite unlimited. How do we want to get there? Basically, uh, just a short uh, introduction on the technology. Amorphous silicon you see on the left side, it's basically this, uh, pretty much the same, it's, uh, you need a front contact, a back contact, you need a PIN junction, an amorphous absorber. That's uh, pretty known since quite some time. By introducing micromorph, so a microcrystalline PIN junction, we actually are able to get 50%, it's a rough figure, uh, more energy absorbed. So basically, if you are having an 80 watt module today, it is a 120 watt module tomorrow, and the only thing what is changing is the absorber. Front contact, back, con back contact, glass, lamination foil, the big cost drivers stay the same. Now, what do you need? You need proven, you need the main equipment, 
what we see is for the front and the back contact, we use uh, TCO1200 equipment. You need uh, best-in-class absorber material. We use for that a Chi-1200. And you need to have a best-in-class um, interconnector. And therefore, we have the laser scribing, the LLS-1200. Now, on the top side, you see actually a bit of a timeline. That's actually how you do it normally, or how it has been done over quite some time in other capital equipment applications, like semiconductor displays. You move in the equipment. You have a system insulation. You do a test, testing and system qualification. There it stops normally. The customer takes over. You see some dots. I'm coming back to the picture later. So talking a bit about the technology, because we think that is really key. It is important, not for single junction amorphous today, but clearly if you want to go to high efficient micromorph technology. We have uh, taken a decision in a quite early stage for an LPCVD approach. Now, when we are talking about TCO, transparent conductive oxide, there are some, I mean, as in semiconductor as well, some key things you're interested in. It got to be as transparent as possible. It got to be as conductive as possible. Now, it is a bit of contradiction. It needs to be optimized. Now, in photovoltaic, there is a third part to the equation, and that's actually the texturing. So basically, what we are interested in, uh, what we are interested in is haze, so light trapping. And here, we actually get the texturing pretty much for free. While we are growing this layer up, it actually grows in a particular texturing way that allows us to really have a high haze. And we are able to code control that by changing process parameters. And if you would want to do that with a PVD process or other process approaches, you will need a wet edge step to get these textures in. We get that for free already in the first deposition process. For us, it's an integral part for micromorph technology. So doing a single junction with commercial TCO, it's easy to do. If you want to go to higher efficiency, TCO is going to become key. And um, the reason why is you need to have an, a high transmission on one side for uh, the visible, but also for the near infrared area. If you do not have that, you're not able to get the full potential out of a microwave device. And the second thing, that is something I've heard over this day, these days quite a bit already is, uh, the biggest drawback people are saying for microcrystalline technology is the thick absorber and the relatively low deposition rates. Now, having a high quality, a best-in-class tissue allows you to make the thinnest bottom cell due to improved haze. Why is that so? To keep it relatively simple, if a light goes through a glass, go through a TCO, if it's really smooth, the light is passing through straight. If you have a haze, a texturing, the light is going to be broken so it's going passing through in an angle. And if you look at the length of these two errors, you clearly can see that one not going, go, going straight through is quite long compared to the straight through. So that allows you to either get higher efficiencies or you can make the same absorber device thinner while keeping the efficiency. And that is one of the key factors if you want to have high throughput.